You're listening to Dead Air Podcast, part of SplatterPictures.net. What's up, everybody? Wes, Dead Air Knife here with Always. Typical Lydia. Today's show, we're going to be doing the 1971 classic, The Blood on Satan's Claw. My skin. Nice, nice. I didn't know what sound you were going to go with. It's always uh, a surprise and a delight, um, Wes Knight, I, when you pick sound. I actually was planning before the somewhat infamous Kathy scene, I was planning on reciting the entire behemoth summoning ritual before I was, I found it online and I was going to read the whole thing. But then when that my skin scene happened, I said, oh, that's a lot easier. I'll just do that. <laughs> yeah, no, because like, yeah, we're, we're lazy here at Dead Air. Uh, so lazy, in fact, that neither of us had seen this film until now. And it is a classic. You are absolutely right. And, I, you know, we've said a million times, you can't watch every movie. We can never, ever disrespect a fellow horror fan for not having seen a film we never disrespect one another for not having seen a film Mm -hmm. but i feel that i've disrespected myself because i really did like this quite a lot and i'm sad that i had missed it so many years have gone by that i could have been watching this this film is a few years older than me so i've had my entire life to watch it well i'm really glad that you are excited we really wanted to sit down and tackle uh what is admittedly a humongous blind spot in my horror knowledge uh i believe one time our dear friend amy had said a really nice compliment about me and i remember every compliment that people give me because i'm a narcissist and uh she had said that i have a such an awareness of the horror genre and that made me feel good, but it's not entirely true because folk horror is something that, while I have seen some, some of the most quintessential examples of this genre, I have not seen. The basics that I have seen, obviously, things like Children of the Corn, I, I'm very familiar with that film. We had done that for the show. Uh, the Wicker Man, I've seen both the original and the remake. But then when it was, get, obviously, like modern classics like The Witch. Uh, but when it came to, and there was a, a documentary that they, uh, one of those long documentaries, like, you know, three hour motherfucker. Were they dis- was that the Kayla Genesee joint, the uh, Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched? That is absolutely correct. And when that documentary dropped on Shutter, I love me a lengthy horror documentary. I'll watch them when they cross my threshold. And while watching that documentary, it was just title after title after title of, I don't even know what this is. I don't even know what the fuck this is. <laughs> and, yep. and it was educational, but it showed me that I still had a lot to learn about this genre. And, you you know, lately on the show, you've been turning to me to discuss some of the older, the moldy oldie horror films that I revel in. But I thought for a change, not a slasher, um, we haven't done too many of these old devil movies old witch movies things like that we tend to we tend to kind of stay in the splattery area so i was really looking forward to expanding my horizons with the blood on satan's claw one of the most famous and most celebrated 
in the folk horror subgenre, and neither one of us had seen it. I was really surprised, too, because, yeah, we're both really well-rounded, but... You know, I temper that surprise always with that disclaimer. Like I said earlier, you can't have watched everything, right? Uh, I'm so glad that we did dip into this because it is a really good follow-up from the Lords of Salem to watch a very contemporary, not folk horror movie really, um, except for like a, a, like the fact that it does go back in time a little bit to the folk horror portion of the show with the Lords of Salem. This is all folk horror all the time. Uh, it makes me want to go back and watch that documentary over again, not just for the few mentions of this movie within it, but start checking off a few more on that list, that vast list of movies that I've never heard of either, right? I'm no uh, specialist in folk horror, but this is the sort of movie I wish I would have been able to watch with my mother. Who She probably would, she, she's probably seen it, you know, more than likely. She loved this sort of stuff where not necessarily folk horror but sort of this ken russell twist on folk horror this ken russell twist on a period piece but it's not ken russell enough that it has a large hallucinatory sequence in it and that's what i like the most about most folk horror is that they're very grounded and this is so extremely grounded that we get uh snail's eye views of horse shit on clogs often within this film and I really did like the fact that it was so, so, so grounded. And there are other films around this time that have that same sort of thing. And most of them, I don't think, made the cut necessarily. So there are some hidden gems for us to uncover, aside from the contemporary hits of the time that were similar. And people, most people have seen The Wicker Man or its remake at the very least. A lot of people have seen Witchfinder General and mm -hmm. a lot of people have seen these, you know, Bloody Sunday or whatever, like, and I'm new to, um, I'm new to Alucarda, which is older and not uh, British, but still <laughs> it's like that contemporary folk horror, more contemporary made folk horror that is a period piece. I'd recently watched uh, Blood of the Fairies. Is that what it's called? Something like that. Fantastic Mexican film. And I, I really do want to fill in some of these gaps because as much as I think summertime is a time for films like slashers that take place at camps, we both recently saw In a Violent Nature and mm. really enjoyed the living shit out of that. That's very summertime to me. This is equally a summertime film because it's that sleepy Sunday, watch a period piece, see people with muddy boots and ducks running around on the screen and talking like my lady and my lord and all that stuff in a, a dreary countryside. You know, if you don't have Eel Marsh House, at least you've got the blood on Satan's claw. You're absolutely right. Now, for context of films like this, for anyone that's interested, when Britain's censorship laws laxed for a brief period of time. Obviously, if you're a horror fan, you'd be well aware that they tightened really hard up in the late 70s into the 1980s, and that's how we got the infamous video nasty list. But before things contract, they must first expand. And when the censorship laws uh, became laxed in the late 1960s, well, really almost coming out of the 50s, but really in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the sex and the blood and the violence just erupted. And there was a lot of sexy shenanigans going on here. Hammer was one of the more famous examples of this, although now looking at those films, they would seem kind of tame, but back then they were quite shocking. But then there was other films like uh, The Virgin Witch and Vampire Lesbos. And even uh, going back to Hammer, like when they were really towards the tail end of their stuff, like uh, The Twins of Evil, there was lots of just sex and nudity and Satanism and vampires and ladies kissing ladies. And that was what they were interested in doing. And so for this time, it can be kind of surprising that things that were coming out in this time period were 
as graphic as they were. Again, even you know, compared to nowadays, maybe people would say, well, that's not very graphic. But back then it was shocking to have this much blood and nudity and sexual assault and just all kinds of things that it seems the second you take the reins off, filmmakers can't wait and audiences can't wait to see how far you can push those boundaries until we see what happens when, you know, tastemakers decide that the boundaries have been pushed too far and then all of a sudden things get heavily censored. Uh, so it's always interesting to have films like this in a little snapshot. A little snapshot indeed. And I'm glad that there are so many of them. And like I said, there's 20 million unearthed gems, I swear, out there because everyone and their dog was making a period piece at the time because they were easy to film. And it was sort of this great enlightenment sort of period in filmmaking well before the the tightening of the, the laws, like the crime code and things mm -hmm, like that, mm -hmm. uh, came roaring back in the early 80s to, you know, make it all feel dangerous again. And thank God for that, because then we have our exploitative films and uh, then we head into the new extremity because everything was taboo once again. But when this was made, there's probably, like I said, a thousand other films very similar to it with maybe even more graphic violence because there were a few things cut from this in the f version you saw and I'm just spoiling the shit out of things um, sort of near the end when they're in a grove and there's a hairy gentleman let's say mm -hmm. did you see any sort of thing that really resembled fellatio going on in that scene Wes? No in fact when you brought it up I quickly started reading uh, a plot synopsis to wonder if I'd like zoned out during that. Did you get a blowjob scene? No, I did not. But apparently there was one and I would love to see it. I don't know if it ended up in any media that's recoverable, if it was something that was cut when it was going through censorship or rating. It was rated X for <laughs> in Britain when it was released. Um, and I think so. I think because of that X rating, there's other things in here that may have garnered an X rating, but that scene must have been shown to get an X rating, I think. But apparently, in that Grove scene with the hairy gentleman, there was that's what she was doing on her knees. When she gets on her knees, she wasn't just hanging out down there. That's pretty interesting. I would love to see a scene in which someone looks like they're blowing a teddy bear bat thing, but. <laughs> but no, the, the version that I saw didn't have that. It's quite possible there are some boutique releases of this film that are available to purchase. Uh, so I would wonder if the completely uncensored censored versions would end up there. There's a lot of examples in horror of censored versus uncensored versions, what becomes available, what not becomes available. Uh, just off the top of my head, Return of the Living Dead Part 3. If you have the VHS copy, you have the true uncut version. And if you have the Vestron kick-ass 4K Blu-ray combo thing that probably would cost you $60, you do not have the fully unedited film. I'm sorry to tell you this, uh, but I have it. And isn't that the most important thing of all? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you are, as you said, a narcissist. <laughs> so, yeah. I could be a, I could be a, a horror collecting supervillain where I just lord over having cooler versions of movies than the average person and then becoming covetous when someone has something better than mine. I must possess all, Lydia, or I possess nothing. I still have that Blu-ray of popcorn that I bought for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> don't get me derailed on popcorn. We're going to talk about that film one day because I got a lot to say about that movie. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> um, fuck all that, Lydia. Fuck popcorn and its weird movie in a movie that became an actual movie mosquito is a thing but forget all that what is this movie even about anyways i want to know this movie is about how you can take hyper contemporary influences like mary bell the child murderer or the manson killings 
that the sensation that rocked the world and probably did what 9-11 had done to the psyches of people in the United States. You can take those as influences, suck them all in and spit them out into a Ken Russell-esque period piece about a satanic panic. Because those things, maybe not Mary Bell so much. And if you're not familiar with that murder, it's a UK it's a UK story, so I can see why a lot of us North Americans may not be familiar. I don't think that was as much of a satanic panic thing, but the Manson murders definitely were, and it kicked off and uh, the, the satanic panic we all know and love. And you can take that and bring it back to the original satanic panic happening. And this is taking place right after the witch trials, right around that time where everyone's still on edge, witches have been persecuted all around, but this is something like deeper and older that they're dealing with. And I really like how you can't quite see straight through to the influences that created this film, but they're, they're there. And I bet at the time this made this film so much more terrifying and so much more of a movie where you look at your neighbors and suspect them and perhaps point them out and maybe scream witchcraft. You really hit the nail on the head there, Lids, with the idea of satanic panic. This film coming out in 1971, the the Manson murders are very much still in people's minds. And also remember that sometimes movies can get made very quickly, but it still takes a couple of years for these things to come out. And so lots of films were coming out in the early 1970s that was banging the drum of the kids aren't all right. What are the youths really doing out there in the deserts and the forests? What are they talking to? Oh, who are they talking to? What are they talking about? Could they be riled to the upper echelons of murder and depravity? Puritans say yes. And so I tons of these films are coming out you know I drink your blood all kinds of stuff like that and you know sitting back and watching this film now all those years ago it's a snapshot in so many different ways of exactly what was on people's minds in the early 1970s now, you might think that it's Easy Rider-esque, you know, it's going to be this thugs in leather, but it's not. And even though we did have a lot of freedoms then as children, I mean, I was largely unsupervised, unfortunately, uh, for, my, for everyone around me <laughs> as a child, running loose, alley cats in the street. You know, it was, it was really a wild time to be a kid when you really had no supervision for the most part in a lot of your kid friends didn't either and we had a lot of access to media not the way that kids do now with the internet and such but there were a lot of interesting films and magazines books paperbacks all kinds of stuff that we could find we could even find them in caches in the forest for crying out loud and that's where a lot of kids spent a lot of time in, in play but yeah you would think that it's more contemporary it's kids on bikes wrecking the neighborhood or it's thugs on mechanical bikes ruining the countryside. But no, it is it is ducks and horses and mud and carriages and candlelight. It's it's beautiful. I mean I, I I literally love this. It opens up kinda sleepy, kinda quiet, kinda old world British countryside. Not in that hammer horror way. There is, you know, a great title sequence featuring a crow or raven. But aside from that, it's not like gnarled trees in the dusky moors in the countryside graveyard. Mm -hmm. It's not quite that atmospheric. It's atmospheric in that you got fluffy haired Ralph towing a thing behind a carriage in a field and he's plowing the furrow and unearths something awkward looking, but he is the most fluffy haired, muddied britches, clogs and <laughs> shirt waist dude I've ever seen in film. He... <laughs> That's uh yes, you're absolutely uh, right. Old uh, Barry Andrews from the, 
from uh, James Bond movies and stuff like that. He uh, he does a great job as being. Is he a Barney Rubble? Do you feel like? Almost. He has way cooler hair than any Barney Rubble I've ever met. I mean, all of them do. And I mean, I don't know. Maybe Mr. Edmonton's a bit of a Barney Rubble too. But you can't tell with these fantastic wigs. Or if they're even wigs, I don't know. Because, like, Barney gets put through his... Barney. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph gets put through his paces. I kept calling Ralph Malf with the fluffy hair. Uh, I don't think that's a wig. It's really hard to say. I know that the 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 judge, he is definitely wearing a wig because we see him, we see him in his nightgown not wearing his wig. And he's got, like, a little cap there to uh, to keep it all uh, contained when Ralph uncovers this thing in the um, in in the fields to us the audience what we're looking at really is a skeleton and it's got some patches but the most striking feature of course is that it has an eye very peculiar because typically those are the first things to go and this is the opposite of that. He goes to the landowner, uh, the judge, who is the you know leader of the town. He's the rich person. He owns a lot of property. And he is absolutely dismissive of Ralph coming there, you know, hat in hand, like, oh, my lord, uh, something awful fearful out there in the... In, in the fields, you might take a look at it. I tell you, it's a fiend. Like, and you have this initial example. It sounds like I'm making fun of it. I'm not. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> and you're, it was quite literally a line <laughs> from that film. Um, he, Ralph represents the simple, not stupid, but simple, poor servant type. And the judge is the modern man. He's not aware of the ways of the country, Lydia. He is a man of the city. And whatever city that might mean in, you know, the 18th century. But it is the classic, inescapable, old world versus new world, even in this ancient setting. And he won't be scared by superstitions and these talks of fiends you found a body that's not unusual oh it's covered in fur and it doesn't look quite human then you found an animal why do i have to go and look at this but he acquiesces the behest of his wife who wants to have her mind put at ease and they go there and sure enough nothing is there the, in fact the only thing they do is they find uh the reverend who is out in the field and he's got a serpent with him, Lydia, a serpent. There's a lot of symbolism in this movie. There really is. If, if you care to look at it mm -hmm. on the other hand, I'm like, this is, this is an awesome album cover, man. It's like, I, I was having a lot of fun with this movie. It was the worm on Satan's eyeball, the hat on Satan's fluffy hair, <laughs> the mud on Satan's boots. <laughs> and this is this snake in Satan's hand because he's our first red herring. And there's, it's not that you need a red herring in this film. We all know um, we, we get an idea that what the kids are up to shortly. But, you know, if there's some something strange afoot, a corpse in a field, and then you've got this priest skulking around the countryside taming snakes, like, okay, he's obviously got something wrong with him. He doesn't, though, which is great, and I love that very much. Um, yeah, there is a lot of symbolism throughout this. And some of it may even be lost on me as a pagan, heathen, devil worshiper myself. I don't know much about Catholicism. I don't know much about Christianity outside of how it fits into demonology. So there could be even more. This would be great to watch with somebody who's deathly afraid of it. <laughs> I think that'd be super fun. But that's something that my mother would have really enjoyed about this film too. Yeah, yeah. There's some pretty religious people in my family, and I was, um, I was a church-going kid, uh, as you well know. And so there's obviously things that uh, I picked up on immediately while watching this film. And I think that if you like the symbolism, I think that there's, you can analyze this film to death because there's a lot of it. 
and but you're also free to just enjoy the film as it is. I don't really think you need to do anything. What one thing that I will say um, is I appreciated quite a bit this film's ability to remind you that you're not really watching an old sleepy movie about a bunch of people with buckles and feathers in their hats and pantaloons because every few minutes there was something horrific or something kind of sexy or you know they were they were doing things to remind you that oh yeah this came out in the 1970s and they were trying to to shock you with violence and they were trying to tantalize you with nudity and appall you with uh, whatever they could and when the incident has subsided things do not wait long we are talking the first 10 minutes of this film we have discovered a fiend in the ground that has mysteriously left we have started to slowly be introduced to this cast of characters lots of frolicking children but then we are introduced to, I don't know if you could call a couple of characters red herrings or not, who are not supposed to be villains, but who you think the story is about. They almost pulled something Hitchcockian, in my opinion, where they have these languid scenes of Peter and Rosalind. Rosalind is his, I mean, it's old timey, so he's introducing her to people and we're getting married tomorrow. What? Like, <laughs> like this is my aunt. This I'm marrying her tomorrow. Now, immediately he, Peter's aunt and even the judge are really, really nasty to Rosalind in, in kind of a tame, but then not so tame way. And they're going to make her go sleep in the attic. And then, Within seconds, Rosalind is left alone. She is screeching and screeching. And you'd think, oh my God, what's in the room with her? And so his aunt, Peter's aunt, goes to check on her, gets her face completely fucking mauled. And the judge is sending her to Bedlam immediately. And then you're just like, oh my God, what hell on earth is this? He can't just send this poor woman who clearly is terrified and who knows what clawed that woman's face. It could be, oh no, she has a claw hand now and she looks nuts. And, and so you say she is, she has been taken over by something and you're, and you say to yourself, can't wait to see where this goes. She goes to Bedlam, and that's the that's that. Like it's just, we're done with this aspect of the story. When I was uh, reading up on this film and understood that it has sort of three segments, uh, I assumed that the old timey farmhouse with Ralph Mouth was the wraparound, and he sort of is. This is a really good way of showing three somewhat desperate stories and having them blend seamlessly so it doesn't feel like you're watching three segments they all really go well together i thought it was a little bit more of an anthology story in that way um and and this is sort of like one of those subplots that get woven in amongst everything else that's going on because before long we see not hide nor hair of ralph mouth barely any of the judge he leaves town mr edmonton peter leaves town everyone leaves fucking town so we're like okay story's over but we're following the 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 claw we're following the fur we're following the strange things that are being found in the furrows of the tilled field by who else hangs out there other than the priest looking for stray animals ralph mouth who's plowing it but the children so we get to follow more people through this town and we get to really know the layout, the other people, the parents of these children somewhat to a certain extent and their interactions with the priest. Like we get to know all of that really, really well. Uh, I really liked the beginning of this, even though in the first like 10 minutes I thought, oh no, this is going to be so sleepy. 
it's going to be like Don't Torture a Duckling, which I thought came out before this, mm-hmm. but came out just after. after. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, it's it had a very similar feeling. And I find Don't Torture Duckling extremely sleepy up until my favorite scene at the end. But <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. It's wonderful, yeah, it, isn't it? It's um, cinematic gold. It really is one of the most iconic like shots in horror in the the end of Don't Torture a Duckling, where I would almost bet 90% of people who know that scene couldn't tell you what movie it's from. But it's uh, pretty incredible. One thing I wanted to interject just for the audience, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, but this film was originally crafted as an anthology. The, the film itself, uh, the original screenplay was Robert Wynn Simmons. And this was charged to come off of the heels of the Witchfinder General from 1968. There was a lot of hype around that film. It was a huge smash success. It made a ton of money. And so the idea was to continue on to making another satanic horror film as a period piece, but this time make it as an anthology. Now, eventually... um, the idea was that it was going to be set in a village and it had the working title of Satan's Skin, which I believe you would have the right idea with the wraparound story being the discovery of this fiend within the fields and then all of these different stories coming together. They decided to, instead of having more direct chapter by chapter, almost more concrete divisions in the storytelling like the film Black Sabbath, but... Uh, that decided to instead do a more continuous uh, narrative as opposed to just making it a straight up anthology. But there's still vestiges of an anthology within this story. That makes a lot of sense, actually, because having seen people refer to it, not as an anthology necessarily, but having segments, um, I didn't expect them to be so well entwined so well wrought and if you're looking for that sort of story if you enjoy something like trick or treat where it does have different stories but they're all so seamlessly blended this is that sort of story and i really enjoyed that angle of it quite a lot especially when i realized that it wouldn't be so sleepy because pretty soon we had almost yellow wallpaper ask screaming women in the upstairs attic of a gothic farmhouse so I, I i really did enjoy that sort of twist and of course when we go from that to hanging out with the children i i know they're going to be up to no good they really are a lot of these what do you want to call them ritualistic play is brought to you with such fun and and like childlike wonder hide and seek and running through the forests and playing keep away in class with like a mysterious pouch of odds and ends and all around there uh, like all around these kids play seems to be their de facto leader of angel and um that's uh, Linda Hayden, who has done Hammer Horror and and uh, lots of things, really. Uh, but um, she is the most defiant one, uh, even though she looks so sweet. She does. She lives up to her name quite well. She looks like an angel. She looks angelic. Uh, my friend Kelly's daughter looked like this when she was little. Uh, still does, to, to for the most part. Like, she's uh, still, even though she's an adult now, she's like... An angelic, blonde, blue-eyed, gorgeous, milky-skinned angel. She looks like a freaking angel, like a Raphaelite angel. That's exactly what this girl is. And she also has that sort of devious smirk. You can tell that behind her eyes, she is very happy to be lording it over her tiny cult of little wee friends because she is like a manipulative charismatic gorgeous little girl right i guess the actress at the time was 17 which is just edging it with the weirdness because we see some toplessness and there's all sorts of weirdness and she gets incredibly evil later in the film which is just delicious really but she's extremely young and plays it up very very well 
So I really enjoy her sort of tete-a-tete with the priest at the beginning because you have an inkling that she's going to be the Satan, the God, the devil, and the Satan all in one little girl. And sort of mentally uh, already butting heads with the, the priest. Who knows she's the ringleader of this keep away where in the sack they have Satan's claw. What of Satan's claw? It's not the blood on Satan's claw singular. It's the, the, the fur attached to the blood on Satan's claws that everyone in town seems to have one of. <laughs> it's kind of cute. It really is true. And we get a glimpse of this process fairly early on in the film with old Peter. Peter is, uh, you know, his aunt vanishes mysteriously. We don't know what happened to her. And Peter, you know, heads into the attic and begins to hallucinate that he's getting choked. And it's so funny because even in that moment, it kind of looks like if I were to try to prank you, like, oh no, someone's attacking me. And I was standing by a door frame and I was pretending like my own arm was pulling me out of frame. It looks like he's doing that with a, a, a bear claw type Thing attached uh, onto his hand and he then attacks it and fights it off and then starts to hack at it with a blade and then you find out oh he's actually hacking off his own hand which is not transformed into Satan's claw whatsoever but he has mutilated himself and he will have that stump uh, because I thought to myself oh They'll probably, well, at least they could probably just sew it back on. And then I realized well, this is not the era for sewing back on hands, Wesley. So no, he, he doesn't have his hand anymore. And this is where the judge definitely knows that something is going on. Something undeniable is going on in this once sleepy, idyllic village. He speaks with the doctor who's treated Peter, and I don't know who exactly has sewn a nice jaunty leather cap for his new stump. He has got, you know, Peter handles this losing a hand thing pretty fine because the next day he's tearing off, tearing ass into the countryside on a horse. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be horseback riding after losing a hand at all, but maybe they play with time a little bit and it's weeks later. It's hard to tell. But the judge knows there's something deeper going on. He's not the type to give into flights of fancy about Satan or witchcraft. It's someone playing pranks. It's somebody that's disappeared a body, somebody who has kidnapped somebody. It's somebody, not a fiend in the forest. But he has his doubts because there are too many weird things going on in town. People haven't been whipped into a satanic fervor quite yet, but things are odd things are going on. So he speaks with the doctor who has a book on witchcraft who and Satanism that or whatever de demons or something that reminded me quite a bit of our conversation about how goofy Satan and devils and demons look in old woodcuts because it's got the goofiest <laughs> picture of like a satanic thing. It, it looks like somebody was trying to draw the devil from memory with their eyes closed. It's <laughs> and their left hand. And yeah. It, and he's got a look on his face like he has a deformity. The seriousness in which he looks at it and delivers the line, right, might I borrow this for study? And he just and they just keep panning back to this ridiculous. It looks like it should be on like a fucking sticker in a skate shop. Like it's so goofy and amateurish. And he is delivering this dialogue with all of the fervor and intensity that you would be looking at some kind of really haunting, creepy, well-made bit of art. And it just looks like shit. And it's fucking hilarious. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I fucking forgot all about it. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is my favorite bit because it's not, there's not a lot played for laughs in this. And it is inadvertent. So you get, get a little joy when you're looking for that comedy in your horror, which I usually am not. But yeah, we had just been talking about how goofy demons look. But yeah, we we really spend a lot of time from this point on because the important adults have left, really, honestly. All we have is bitchy women 
a priest. We, we don't pay too much attention to the doctor, the squire, or the guy that lives on the edge of town in a tent, <laughs> really, at this point. It's all about the kids. We get to meet little Mark, another blonde, angelic-looking boy. Mm -hmm. He's got, what, sisters and angel. And we get to hang out with the kids that are traipsing through the forest, daring each other on things, playing blind man's bluff, and getting into all sorts of shenanigans because they're basically unattended. Shenanigans... Like cold blooded murder. <laughs> this film has an aspect to it which I find very fascinating, and I'm wondering if you picked up on it too. But I certainly picked on it, uh, picked up on it by the time young Mark is murdered, and that is the somewhat lackadaisical way that this film traipses through its most horrific forms of storytelling. They don't linger on things. They just happen and they move on. And if it's a blink and you'll miss it, whoa, what the fuck did they just do to that kid? Whoa, what the fuck did they just do to that girl? Like, and I, I, I find it really contributes to the darkly whimsical um, way that these children behave with each other, where play can turn to murder in the blink of an eye, and they're so unfazed by there there is no delineation between childlike play and rape, murder, and mayhem that they move on past it as if nothing has happened. It makes me want to watch things like the kids and things like that with, you know, and the old, the original bully and where kids do go from play to murder in the blink of an eye. A book that reminded me quite a bit of the way that these kids play quote unquote play is uh, let's go play at the Adams, which is a very controversial book. Uh, Mendel Johnson, I think is the name of the author. Uh, he he died not too long after writing it, and he regretted writing it because it is so dark. But it's about kids that are unattended and play in this most horrific way. It's terrible, and it's a sad and touching book, but it is a real snapshot of kids in the age that this film was made in the seventies, because they've got all this newly broadcast footage of war and war games. And they're hearing about how you torture people and things like that. So I think that might've been on the mind of the, the writers here, aside from the mayhem of the Manson murders and Mary bell, just killing people. Cause she thought it was fun and it's fun to be evil and that sort of thing. And if you see old pictures of Mary bell, she's not too different than angel our little ringleader here, but it uh, is very much, like you said, going from one thing to another in the blink of an eye. And then you just carry on, not as if nothing happened because it is all part of the integral plot, but because it happened in spite of it happening, you just onto the next weird game that these kids are going to play or onto the next strange conversation amongst the adults about the missing people in town. I mean, it's very much what is happening. Who are you? I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's work to use a Rob Zombie line <laughs> or, or a what Patricia Kenwinkle line. I don't know which of the Manson girls said a line like that during the murder. I believe it was Tex Watson that said that line. It was Tex? I believe it was Tex. Okay, I thought it was like Susan Atkins, but it was a boy. Yeah, okay. I believe it, it was, it was, it was Tex Watson. Hmm. Charles Tex Watson, you son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> um uh i had recently uh, uh reread helter skelter i think that's how come it's sticking in my mind a little bit um recently like six months ago but still <laughs> yeah still that, that's much more recent than the last time i had watched it um or than the last time i had read it and even though i was moved to read it after watching once upon a time in hollywood mm because it is just that whole other, you know, um, what do you call alternate history sort of take on the Manson story. But, you know, you can be, like I said, influenced by those sort stories and come up with something completely different. Yeah, absolutely. Now, 
Angel Blake. Young Angel Blake. She is a no good Nick. She is in charge of an unruly pack of Satan worshiping children. There is murder. There is mayhem. And she is attempting to swell her ranks by attempting to swell something else. I'm sorry. The pastor's pants. The, pa- the pastor's pants. Now, Reverend uh, Fallowfield, this is the first time watch for me. So watching this scene, perhaps it's my own prejudice against a man of the cloth. But I was absolutely convinced he was going to fold. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps he would only like it if they weren't willing. But Angel Blake removes her clothes is completely naked and is trying to seduce him. And he banishes her from his presence. And she calls him a Puritan or she shouts at him or something like that by, and is quite rejected. And then she tries to pull almost successfully the next day. She tries to pull Uh, Reverend Fallowfield into the fire by accusing him of assaulting her and wanting to see her naked and, and, and wanting to have sex with her. And she said no. And he took it from her. Uh, That didn't happen in this case. And she might've gotten away with it too. If she could, and if her and her friends could just stop raping and murdering for five minutes. Yeah, I know. It's not like they have nothing better to do. Didn't you have chores as a kid? Didn't these kids have chores? Didn't they have to churn butter? Didn't they have to collect eggs and shit like that? No, they've got their parents running out of town, probably walking to London to get medicine and stupid crap like that. These kids don't have any chores. Like, I don't want to go to the other extreme of beat your kids, but... Give them fucking something to do. My God, give them chores. Give them structure. These kids have no structure, and that's the problem. But I thought it was interesting, just in a name, and this is another really cool way. Like, Stephen King is the king of naming characters. Whoever named Reverend Fallowfield worked for me because I was like, well, of course he can't get it up. Because how do you have a fallow field? You salt the land. Nothing grows probably fed saltpeter in an orphanage where they usually found priests because priests had no family to leave so it was a great way to recruit priests to go to the orphanage so he was probably completely neutered chemically neutered by saltpeter at that age and I just assumed that he was a follow field that is actually pretty damn clever um Kathy is going to be lured. Now, Kathy is a, is a character that old Ralph, if you remember Ralph at the beginning of this picture, was fairly sweet on, and she is going to get lured because her brother, none other than Mark, was murdered. She's bringing flowers to his grave, and she's attacked by two boys, and they'd say it's kind of a game. My question to you is this, Lydia. Maybe getting attacked by two boys and tied up with rope could be considered a game. And for a while, she seems to be frolicking. And there's old Angel, Angel Blake, and she seems to be in on it too. And now there's, hang on a sec, there's a lot of people here. But the second that we see some geezers, we see some old heads, we see some boomers, Lydia, my hackles would be up. This is not a game anymore. It is the weirdest scene. And I love this whole sequence from her being like picking flowers and enticed by these, you know, basically Mary and Pip Mm -hmm. from Hobbiton in the Shire. And they refer to it as the Shire, of course, because it is a Shire and it's just kind of adorable because they are very much these like little Hobbit type dudes that want to play with her with the rope and stuff like that. And you're our prisoner. Very, very, very strange game indeed. Uh, that when it comes to the full-on almost cult that she gets dragged to, 
not quite cooking and screaming because she is somewhat complacent thinking that it's a game and it's going to be over. This is a position that a lot of women throughout history and every single day find themselves in mm -hmm. thinking, well, if I just go along for a moment, I'll be able to come out the other side and this will be over and I'll escape. And without getting into really dark territory of date rape and such, that's this is a lot of how it happens. So you can see it unfolding here and wonder why what why at the beginning she didn't just say no, I don't want to play with you guys and walk the other way because of the threat of violence, the implication, as it were, that they could overpower her within a heartbeat. And they do look quite insidious, don't they? Do they look like they're having fun, these two boys? No, they don't look like they're having fun at all. And in fact, the more they try to convince her that it's just a game, it's coming off as, it's just a game. We're just, it's a game. Who talks like that and is going to be convinced? It's bad enough that all of a sudden people are holding sticks, branches, and people are mutilated. There's people bandaged up with fresh wounds. There's a girl missing a hand that has a stick in her stump like we're in Titus and Jodicus here or and and there are these elderly people and th th they are starting to read from a book and there's a goat man there's a behemoth the behemoth themselves and she is just wide-eyed and wonderment and unfortunately uh, they have designs on her, and we reveal that when her clothes are torn away, unfortunately, uh, she has a, a hairy patch on her back. Nothing to be ashamed of, Kathy. I have the same thing. But it's not the skin of the devil, and that's where the behemoth says, my skin. And, well, they assault her. And then uh, stab her with some uh, sheep shears. Sheep shears, yeah. I have a pair of those at my father's house. Uh, exactly like that. I have a, have a scythe that I actually brought home that's upstairs. It looks a lot like the one featured in this film. And yeah, it, it is a really brutal scene. The only people here that look like they're having fun are the boomers that are hanging out mm -hmm. in the back, which I'm not, that it's not explained. Are they enthralled with her? Are they related to her? Are they the ones who maybe encouraged this behavior? I love that they're just sort of non-entities in the background that you have a lot of questions about. There seems to be this idea that Angel Blake or perhaps being, uh, as they're performing this black mass or perhaps they've done things like this similarly before, but this is this idea that the fiend, the behemoth themselves, is expanding its influence over the people of this town. Somehow, these elderly people are related to some of these children. It's a small village. Everyone kind of knows everybody, and they just got taken under the influence. And what's wrong with having some more uh, followers to the cause? Uh, so to speak, it's interesting to see the generational uh, mixing of all these different types of people because it would be, in my opinion, almost too easy to just make it children because then it becomes too powerful or too on the nose metaphor of satanic panic and the Manson kids and what we're really afraid of because the aspect also of the Manson family was they were pulling in people from all ages and all walks of life. And it really was giving into the dark side of hippie culture that if you know anything about that era, the youth movement has a lot of, had a lot of eyes on it, a lot of bigness, a lot of excitement, a lot of free love. And that attracted people outside of the cause that just wanted to have some sex and do some drugs. And some of them would profess themselves to be these gurus when they really were just sexual predators trying to manipulate people. And they were there for unscrupulous reasons as opposed to the idea of peace, love, and togetherness that the original hippie movement was coming. It 
corrupted and co-opted this message, which the ultimate example of that is the Manson family themselves. And it was so appropriate that all of this went down in 1969 because you really can say the 60s as a concept died in 1969. And the 70s really was the aftermath of this sense of absolute betrayal of everyone's ideals. And it was so dark and gritty and muddy. And all of these auteur filmmakers came out of the 1960s feeling that betrayal. And that's how you got the dark decade of horror that the 1970s was really all about. And what really uh, came to the surface was some of the darkest films at the time that were ever made. And so I like that this is included in this film and sorry to go on and on about this one random thing, but no, it's fine. It helps tie this for me to the Lords of Salem because we wouldn't have a Rob Zombie if we hadn't had that era of filmmaking. Cause that is what he grew up on and what he thrived on when he's like, he would refer to himself as a monster kid and he is a monster kid, but he's also into this, this deviousness and the fear of the person next door and the fear of what the kids are doing and the, and the fear that there is something greater, a cabal that is festering just outside of our vision. And these older people also have like that Rosemary's baby sort of thing. Like the whole building of these geriatric Satan worshipers are all in on it. And it also helps that we are closing in on the elusive, active, and hardest to take down group of all the middle-aged adults in town, because this is proof in a way that there's something going on. We have the guy that lives on the edge of town in a tent saying, oh yeah, we see Angel out here all the time with her friends in tow doing all sorts of terrible things. We have Reverend Fallowfield who's been accused of the worst thing a, a man of, of the cloth could be accused of is like child abuse and sexual deviancy. We have like missing bodies that are being attributed to this group of kids plus two older people. <laughs> um, <laughs> these are the things that are going to help convince the people of the town who are the targets, the last to be converted if this cult were to take over this town and the strongest and most formidable foe that they would have because there's more of them, they're intelligent, and they're together and against them. So this is them sort of tightening the loop around the town by getting all the young ones, all the old ones, and then you can just sort of move in on all the adults. Yes, the, the term surrounded comes to mind. Uh, when Ralph finally discovers Kathy's body, it's a bit too late, and he is obviously crestfallen at what has become of her and because of this the reverend is actually spared so in a weird way Kathy's death wasn't without meaning she was able to like Ralph knew enough that Angel Blake would be a part of this now this leads into the sequence if you're not if gang it's your old pal Wes here and I know you like the yucks I know you like to laugh at things, and I know you love when I laugh at things. Let me laugh at something really fucking hard, because I, I cannot fucking believe that this sequence happened, and it was played so straight, and I could not stop fucking laughing. And that is, we have ourselves a good old-fashioned woman dunking, and... When, um, when Margaret is surrounded by these hooligans, these, these middle-aged men just pull up, she's a witch, ain't she? And they pitch her ass like Frankenstein's monster into a river, <laughs> wherefore she sinks like a fucking stone and they're just like if she comes back up to the surface she's a witch she is if so if you float you're a witch but don't worry guys she's going to sink like she is a fucking hefty bag full of concrete and not come back up 
And then everyone just sort of, well, that's it. We murdered her. And then they walk away. That's not the part that was funny to me, although it was pretty damn close. I was already quite amused at the chaos of this fucking scene of just <laughs> pitching this woman into the river. So she floats, to, <laughs> she floats to the surface and Ralph goes in the water to rescue her. Gang, it's waist deep. It is, <laughs> it is waist deep water. It's like Margaret, baby, stand up. <laughs> Well, you, you know, maybe she got her head head hit on a rock when they threw her in. You never know. She seems pretty out of it. So something happened. It, right? It's the skin of Satan weighing her down. All that goat fur got waterlogged. And it, it, it was mm -hmm. like an anchor. Um, weirdly, it also disproves their theory about how you tell she's a witch or touched by Satan because... She is touched by Satan and we have physical evidence and Ralph is going to bring her to the barn and she has lived. She's miraculously managed to survive, almost drowning. Listen, people can drown in an inch of water. It's possible, but this was... Oh, sure. If there's something else wrong with her, but she could have, if she was as active as she was when she was suddenly accosted by this group of men and thrown into the river, she could have just st stood up. I had many conversations with, as a child when I heard about witch dunking and my gra asking my grandmother as if I thought she was alive at the time or something. <laughs> kid logic, <laughs> you know, kid logic. Well, she was born in like 1911 or something like that. So like kind of, kind of close enough, right? Mm -hmm. Kid logic for sure. And I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. It used to make me angry. Cause I was like, it's then she would die. And she's like, yeah, that's, that's the, the horror of it all mm -hmm. is that if she wasn't a witch, she would die. And then what you shrug and walk away. Yep. That's what these guys do. But yeah, thank God for Ralph Mal for the fluffy hair and the muddy boots because he takes her to safety and the doctor's there to help exercise or excise this patch of Satan's flesh i like this scene quite a bit and i also love that it wasn't so glib as to well once you remove the fur patch she is no longer a zealot to this behemoth uh it doesn't really affect her at all although she becomes the person to which uh, i was gonna say canary in a coal mine there is a canary scene in this fucking movie if you weren't convinced that a bad omen was uh coming um also the the rabbit the the symbolism of the rabbit and stuff like that there's lots of like things about virgin virginity and innocence and all that kind of stuff very interesting uh well done in that regard margaret is cannot be saved and she tries to even convince ralph you could be with Angel Blake. You can lie with me. You can, this is, this, like, we're all just out in the woods fucking all day long. Like, <laughs> you want to get in on this, right? Ralph, a better man than me, was not going to be convinced by rutting Lydia. Says the man who's about to head out for the entire weekend to the forest. Wink, wink. Okay, Wes. That's right. Uh, there's, <laughs> I'm just going to like end up like fucking pitched in a river and drowning in waist deep water just for my mockery of poor Margaret. No, I can't see that, you know, but I can see you making yourself a nice apple blossom wreath to wear mm. in your hair. That's right. I'm just going to stand statuesque on the end of the dock and and scare the shit out of my fucking neighbors in the middle of the night. Um, when... When they discover that Angel Blake and them are in the woods, they need someone to track her down. We need to fuck get the dogs on them. And the dogs are just bloodthirsty for Satan meat because they have that tuft of hair that they can smell. And Margaret goes off looking like running and Angel is quite suspicious of 
Margaret. And they have a, a scene in which I really enjoy. It was nice to see the cultists talking to each other, if this makes any sense, talking to each other, not as zealots, not sermonizing the behemoth, not reading from any text, not trying to seduce somebody, but literally just two cultists who were already on the other side of this talking to each other. And it was the first time that Angel ever really seemed worried about anything because she always seemed in complete control of every scenario. But this sequence with Margaret, you can tell they don't really like each other very much, although they, they still are somewhat on the same page. But Margaret, not only is she completely compromised because she no longer has the flesh of the Satan, it was, it was uh, done to her. And she tried to explain that I couldn't help it. Like they took this from me. And she's caught in a bear trap now. Um, Angel leaves her to get eaten by the dogs. I don't know why they thought that the dogs were going to rip her to shreds. They might have. That'd be pretty intense. But instead, it allows them to... The judge, who is now fully like on the hunt for these kids, it allows them to um, try to track them down because they have their big what do you want to call it? Their final ritual, perhaps like manifesting this thing fully because the plot is this. Each one of these bits of skin and these bits of limbs that they are removing from themselves, they are offering it to this behemoth. And I don't know which one of them had to give up their dick, Lydia, but I bet somebody did. If he's getting blown, that's all I'm saying. Someone had to give him, he was a skeleton beforehand. Someone was like, take my cock and balls, behemoth. But I love this aspect of cobbling together a demon into the material world. They would have found the eye in the field mm -hmm. from some random fiend or just passerby. <clears throat> They could have taken anything from Mark. They could have taken anything from the the housekeeper, wife type person, friend, uh, Edmonton's aunt. Mm -hmm. And they could have taken anything. Anyone coming in or out of the town could have donated any body part mm -hmm. to this behemoth that they're they're resurrecting or manifesting. I mean, who knows whatever happened to good people father fallow fields penis <laughs> if he ever like was actually neutered who knows because he does he is like just a noble person too right so he probably is fully intact and i'm just guessing at these things but they could have found a penis anywhere but you know i think that he comes with his own penis the giant ice dick of satan he might and the breast is yet to come the best is yet to come because we have some frolicking and we have some nudity and we have poor Ralph who has been captured and now has a bit of Satan's skin on his leg and this sequence so much is so much of this influence is done through rhythm dance looks it's almost like you, you can see people becoming overwhelmed by this power it's very it's very seductive without dialogue and I think that if you were to try to add too much dialogue to these scenes that would come off as quite cringy. So I like the choice to keep everything um, it, with body language and you, and you it's communicating perfectly what is going on inside these characters minds. But Lydia, we're about getting out of here and there's one thing that we have not counted on. It's angels absolute inability to see a pitchfork as she's running into it and getting herself murdered. And if that's not enough, the judge has not come without the executioner. That is a completely massive fucking broadsword that he is going to swing like a man who has never held a sword. But 
it's going to be enough because when you think that these cultists, the, the, the reaction of the cultists is so funny because they're almost like, oh my God, he's he's got a sword. This is, the, uh, and the, the judge faces down the behemoth and man, this mask sucks. I, th like, I don't, there's, there's something about it where he looks almost like a bat to me. Like it's a scrunched up like bat face. Whereas beforehand, I thought it was more of a Baphomet goat type scenario. I felt like in the previous scenes, the scene with Kathy, where we get a glimpse of the fiend or the behemoth, I thought I had a more concrete idea about what this character looked like. And for some reason in this scene, he looks completely different. Thoughts? Do you agree? I do agree. I do agree. On while I think that it's more scary or terrifying than the demon or proto demon from the previous film that we watched. Agreed. Lords of Salem. Yeah, it's much more effective and scary looking. It's as far as demonic entities manifested that you're going face to face with a sword wielding priest or sword wielding judge. I mean, it's, it's just not, it's not scary and it's less scary than a lot of the other monster type films and monster films from the decade previous. There's films in the sixties and early seventies that do it so much better. You know, even if it is a man in a rubber suit, there's something interesting or at least cohesive about the demon. And this doesn't look, it doesn't look like the picture in the book either <laughs> when, when you get down to the nitty gritty. We have a moment in which the judge impales this beast and in an incredible feat of strength hoists it up like over his head and you do not get the pipe smoking, teetotaling, silken fop persona of the judge at the beginning of this movie. He is a man that will not be denied. He has a lot of power He's been resting this whole film and he's going to exude that power and he's going to pitch this demon's body onto a pyre. And as he burns, everyone comes to Ralph's leg becomes free of this flesh of um, Satan. And we're getting out of this, but the, the original ending was a lot darker to this film but it was changed because it was deemed too depressing in which um it was kind of like um the entire village is killed by a militia that is uh gathered together by the judge essentially uh coming in slaughtering everybody and well that's the end of the cult. That's how it was originally supposed to go down. But they made the decision last minute to just fell the demon and lift the curse and the villagers are all okay. And the worst of the worst, Angel Blake is already dead. Which, you know, kind of works in a way. I can see, you know, because this film ends on a freeze frame of the judge's eye through the flames of the pyre on which the demon is burning. Mm -hmm. And... It's like, oh, okay, is, is, is it over kind of thing? Because, yeah, he's, you know, saved everybody and, and killed the evil ones or whatever. But it's just, it's a weird look and it's a weird moment. If there had been a militia that slaughtered everybody in town, that would have been a so much more fitting end because you would have been like, well, who's the evil one now? Because he's got this kind of like weird look and he's, you're looking at him through flames. So like he's wreathed in flame not unlike a demon himself so I, I didn't I didn't understand how that last scene would have worked but if it had been the ending to something that something more grand and more of a downer ending that would have made a lot of sense but I, I would have liked to see that although it was fun and fairy tale like to see everyone recover and all the little demon skin and fur is gone and the peasants rejoice 
<laughs> I feel like the original ending would be too realistic. That seems lar far more likely what would happen. And the fact that there was a demon there or not was completely irrelevant because we've seen cults, violent cults, get murdered uh, by law enforcement before in, in our own history. And so this would just seem, oh, okay, this is what happens when cults turn to murder and there's a big standoff and then everyone just gets slaughtered because at the end of the day, like you're not really going to go up against uh, a, a well-organized militia. But yeah, there there's a lot more magic in the air in terms of how this ending played out. And I do kind of think that there's a lot of darkness in this film and the more you think about the plot, the more you realize how dark this movie actually is. And I think that, uh, you know, sometimes the goodies win um, is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, this film got kind of middling reviews at the time, unfortunately, going off of the heels of the Witchfinder General and other films of its ilk. It didn't really do well at the time. It did not make its money back at the box office, but it has become one of the most iconic bits of folk horror in existence and one that has a pretty strong fan base and is often held up as the uh, best that the subgenre has to offer. I really enjoyed it. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm glad I got to see it. I feel crummy that I'd missed it all these years because this would be a, a good one. I'll definitely be rewatching this. I, I may like to add it to my library. Just, you know, I'll join that cult. It's a cult classic for a reason. I will join that cult. And speaking of cults, I heard that the uh, Heaven's Gate website just went down. So I just want to check it now and make sure it's back up and running. Because, like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> Contemporary cults. Donald Trump started his campaign trail this time around, and maybe last time too, I don't know, at Waco. Because he feel some sort of kinship with those people who have been crushed by the man and held down by the man like the branch davidians like what the fuck man seriously i mean i'm all for the manson girls that are slowly getting out of jail the ones that are still alive anyone involved in that because they were manipulated by a madman or just a general crazy person a manipulative person so to speak I'm all for that, but I'm not all for Heaven's Gate still existing and the Branch Davidians allowed to carry on at their compound. You know, like maybe maybe we need someone wielding the sword of God because there must have been something else with that sword. The judge himself isn't very imposing and a bit of a flake, but that sword, man, something to that. I find it interesting that it wasn't Ralph that got the final blow. Ralph really... Ralph came hat in hand to the Lord of the land asking for help and confirmation on things. And at the end of the day, it wasn't the country, yet a man from the city who saved them all. So kind of interesting. So what do we got next for him? Coming up next, we have In a Violent Nature. It's a brand new film, too. Uh, very interesting that we've done so many new movies the last, like, rolling 52 week period of dead air podcast while dipping into some of the oldie moldies that I really want to talk to Wes about, but this is something that Wes is very excited about. I find that when I sat down and I experienced in a violent nature, I was so captivated by something so old and traditional, but in a perspective that was wholly unique. And if I had a call to any and all filmmakers who keep trying to make slashers and over explain things and, and try to give everyone a backstory and saying that the audiences won't accept a traditional slasher anymore and keep re bringing out old camp stories that we have 12 to fucking 13 fucking sequels to, Let's go back to brass tacks and all we're going to do is shift our camera perspective 45 degrees to the left and you have one of the most creative and best slashers 
ever made. Wow, that is some heavy words. <laughs> and I like that you say you experienced this film because that's what it feels like. It really does. And I'm fucking stoked to talk about that movie next time. Awesome. Me too. I'm Wes Knight. And I'm Typical Lydia. And you've been listening to Dead Air. If you like this show, you can find more episodes and other content on spotterpictures.net, Spotify, or wherever you download podcasts. We also upload all episodes to YouTube now, if you'd prefer to listen that way. You can find us across social media like Instagram, X, and TikTok. And the show is edited by Lydia Peaver and hosted by Lydia Peaver and me, Wes Knight. We'll see you next time.